Hello people, it's your boy Nathan and um, just thinking about how foolish I am. Yes, uh, where do you start with my foolishness? Does it know no end? But in particular, um, how I, I, I get frustrated and, uh, you know, about um, not getting enough hours on the clock and uh, the, the, my, the, my the narrating work being so hard and so on and I think to myself hang on a second well number one I should rejoice and be be glad that I have work and and so on uh, you know but I'm getting paid to read this stuff and um you know that is fantastic and I'm getting paid to educate myself or at least bleach out my brain with uh, good stuff and um, you know, I'm I'm always living uh, in the future, probably not in a good way. I'm sure there's a good way to do that, but uh, you know, I should just rejoice and be glad in the in the moment as well as um, and just uh, th think of the of the thousands, tens of thousands of people who will be touched by these recordings. I have confidence that. Even after my my death, I tell you what, that's some thought. So let's get on it and um, get right on it. Get right on it, as someone once said. Six, common ground in being. For Aquinas, there is a common world of God and man. For being is found to be common to all things, however otherwise different. From one principle of being, all things have their existence. The Archimedean points in this one world of being is the intellect of man and the correlativity of knowledge and being. In Nigrin's words, with respect to the medieval idea of love, so the Thomistic perspective recalls a Gothic cathedral where the massive stone rests firmly on the earth and yet everything seems to aspire upwards. Nature thus is the starting point, the foundation, and, as we have seen, grace does not destroy nature but perfects it. Thus, for Aquinas, the natural is inherently defective, it partakes of the nature of non-being, hence sin is partly at least to be ascribed to finitude. For Kuiper, the natural as it came. Kuiper, I'm just going to say Kuiper. Kuiper. Totally great. Boom, boom, boom. For Kuiper, the natural as it came from the hand of God was perfect. Although liable to an ethical fall as well as to development, Aquinas substituted for the Greek form matter dialectic not the Christian view but a similar dialectic of Greek. It's all right. We're just getting warmed up. Joy, joy, right now. Not the Christian view, but a similar dialectic of grace and nature. In this tension, one or the other had to be sacrificed. For Thomism, the two foundational tenets of this system were the positing of the autonomy of natural reason in the entire sphere of natural knowledge and the thesis that nature is the understructure or... Hmm. We're, we're doing it. All right, this is difficult. And the thesis that nature is the understructure or... Mm, in our sphere of natural knowledge. And the thesis that nature is the understructure of supernatural grace. Aquinas' attempt to reconcile a Greek dialectic to Christian theology created insuperable problems. The Greek form matter motive in all its different conceptions excludes in principle the idea of creation in its biblical sense. 
The sum total of the Greek wisdom concerning the origin of the cosmos is ex nihilo nihil fit, from nothing nothing can originate. At the utmost, Greek metaphysical theology could arrive at the idea of a divine demiurge who gives form gives. who gives form to an original matter as the supreme architect and artist. Therefore, the scholastic accommodation of the Aristotelian concept of God to the church doctrine of creation could never lead to a reconciliation with the biblical ground motive. The unmoved mover of Aristotelian metaphysics, who, as the absolute theoretical theoretical noose, theoretical noose only has himself as the object of his thoughts in blessed self-contemplation is the radical opposite of the living God who revealed himself as creator. Thomas may teach that God has brought forth natural things according to both of their form and... Ah. Ech. Thomas may teach that God has brought forth natural things according to... I will not be frustrated. I'm enjoying, enjoying the moment. Thomas may teach that God has brought forth natural things according both to their form and matter, but the principle of matter, as the principle of metaphysical and religious imperfection, cannot find its origin in a pure form. God nor could the Aristotelian conception of human nature be reconciled to the biblical conception concerning the creation of men in the image of God. According to Thomas, human nature is a composition of immaterial body and irrational soul as a substantial form, which, in contradistinction to Aristotle's conception, is conceived of as an immoral substance this scholastic view has no room for the biblical conception of the radical religious unity of human existence. Instead of this unity, a natural and a supernatural aspect is distinguished in the creation of man. The supernatural side was the original gift of grace, which, as a donum superadditum, was ascribed to the rational nature. Man, a composite finds his principle of individuality in matter, whereas the intellectual principle is the form of man. This means a fundamental depreciation of individuality, since, in the Aristotelian view, matter is a principle of imperfection. Thomas Aquinas seeks the principium individual at... I, I tried it, I gave it a go... Principium individua, individuatonis, principium individuatonis, individua, individuatonis, principium individuatonis, individ, individuatonis, 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 principium, principium individuatonis. <laughs> Principium individuatonis, individ, individuationis, individuationis, individuat, individuationis, individuat, individuationis. Hmm. Principium individuatonis. Principium individuat. Ay. Principium. Individuato, individuationis, individuatonis, individuationis, individu, individuationis. Materia signata vel individualis. Principium individuationis, in a materia signata vel individualis. 
Summa Theologia 372-2, a conception that frankly contradicts his scholastic Christian view of individual immorality. Ooh. Oh, that's so poor. Ah, oh, that's going to have to redo the whole thing. Six, Principium Individuatunis, Individua. Ooh. Principium Individuationis, in a Materia Signata vel Individualis, Summa Theologiae 3.72.2, a conception that frankly contradicts his scholastic Christian view of individual immortality of the rational soul as form and substance. In order to save the latter, he had to take refuge in the hypothesis of formae separati that were individualized by their having been created in proportion to a material body. Seven, the one and the many in Aquinas. This means that Aquinas had a problem in maintaining any proper relationship between the one and the many, since particularity was an attribute of matter. First of all, Aquinas tended to separate his universals from God, and he held that in God there is neither universal nor particular. For Aquinas, the one precedes the many. Hence Plato said that unity must come before multitude, and Aristotle said that whatever is greatest in being and greatest in truth is the cause of every being and of every truth, just as whatever is the greatest in heat is the cause of all heat. This is the basis of Thomas's doctrine of creation, the one as the cause of the many. Hang on a second. The one as the cause of the many, because the many must, by definition, originate in the one. For Aristotle, this man... <laughs> For Aristotle, this made man a creature of the state, the social one, and the universe the creature of chaos, the cosmic one. The source for Aquinas is the one, and the goal is also the one unity in which the many find their perfection. He did, of course, try to maintain a balance between the one and the many, between universals and particulars, holding that, to have real existence, the universals must exist in the particulars as their essence, not as abstractions beside them. He sought to maintain this balance in... Uh, He sought to maintain this balance in every area. I'm sorry, if it was painful for you, it's more painful for me, particularly since I'm crouching at my knees at the moment. I'm just going to get rid of this bench. Oh, small bench, go away. I'm going to see if I'm going to do this uh, this first time. People who say the first is the first time for everything, I don't know what they're talking about. I mean, I've never bungee dumped and I probably never will. That's the first time for everything. Maybe in some sense that is true. Back in the hood, like I knew I would. So good, it's very nice. Really quite nice. Etc. What am I doing? What am I doing? What am I looking for? Oh, I'm so sorry for being unprofessional. Ah, let's take it down a notch. Oh, there we go. Are you well now? Are you doing okay now? How you doing there now? How you doing there, boy? How you doing? You all right now? Oh. 
I almost spilled me water. Sure, look at that. Would you credit that at all now? Okay. Gonna have to rejig this uh, booth here, the booth of truth. Hmm. Let's try this instead. I know this is probably not the TV that you were looking for. Perhaps there are better shows on. Even on Netflix, maybe. I don't know. It. The state. In accepting Aristotle, Aquinas was prepared to accept the doctrine that man was a political being whose potentialities could only be fulfilled in political society. The Christian revolution of the early centuries had been a great one where the matter of sovereignty is concerned. Ugh. The Christian revolution of the early centuries had been a great one where the matter of sovereignty is concerned. In the days before Christianity, the world knew of one sovereignty only, that of the state, which exercised its sway alike on religious and civil life, on the spiritual and on the temporal. With the advent of Christianity, this unity was destroyed. Augustinianism placed church and state alike under the sovereignty of God, Aquinas, by holding to the perfection of nature by grace, made the church the perfection of the states and the superior authority. The state authority in... Let me just read. The states had an autonomy in the natural sphere, but at every point this natural sphere pointed to and was perfected in the sphere of grace. Hence, at every point the state, while independent of, was subordinate to the church. What Leckler called the Christian Revolution was, according to Duivert, the death blow to the Aristotelian view of a perfect community. The latter implied a transformation of the divine world order into a metaphysical order of reason and, in its theory of the substantial form of human nature, it arrested the transcendental societal idea of mankind in the idea of a rational and moral perfection, attainable in this state alone. The Christian view did not place a new community, the Church in its transcendent religious sense, on a parallel with, or if need be, above all temporal relationships as a merely higher level in the development of human perfection, nor did it project a cosmopolitical temporal community of mankind beyond all boundaries of families, races and states in the Stoic fashion. Instead, it laid bare the religious meaning totality of all social relationships, each of which ought to express this meaning totality according to its own inner structure. Without the... We're doing good. Without this insight into the radical spiritual foundation of human societal life, the differentiation of structural principles of temporal society cannot be understood in its true meaning. By reviving this Aristotelian concept, Aquinas did two things. First, he made the church the true state of man in the ultimate sense as the perfection of nature. Second, he gave to the state a freedom from the Christian doctrine of the state and a rationale for its revived assertion that man's true life and community are attainable in the state alone. His Aristotelianism destroyed medieval Augustinianism and furthered two counterclaims to total power, the state and the church each claiming to be the order of true reason and of man's perfection. A further danger was created by Thomism. The dialectical tension between nature and grace led to a desire by some to sh uh, shave off.
to shave off the ostensibly superfluous world of grace and leave to nature. Grace and leave to nature a world of anarchic plurality, whereas others so infused the world of nature with a divine being that a virtual pantheism was created. The result was a cultural collapse. Aquinas had earnestly sought a new weapon for the faith in the Aristotelian thought of the Arabic and Jewish Enlightenment of the Middle Ages. The immediate result was a new and broader claim to power for the Church, but by introducing a non-Christian foundation into the structure of the church, the scholastics also introduced this same pagan foundation into the university, into the state and into all of man's life. In terms of this foundation, non-Christian and anti-Christian motives and directions were built into every area of late medieval life, to the destruction of Christian order. I have not been drinking. That is not slurred speech. This is a free translation. I'm a good narrator. I honestly am. I'm just having a bad day. That's all. Oh boy. Oh boy, I tell you now, boy, I tell you. Well, say. I'll tell you what. Okay, uh, where are we? I said, where are we? No answer? Huh, I know. We're in chapter 8. Oh, oh, we're good, we're good, we're good. Frederick II, the Revenge of Frederick. Chapter 8. Frederick the Second and Dante, the world redivinized. One, medieval civilization. Humanists, Roman Catholics, and Protestants commonly err in their accounts of "quote unquote" medieval civilization in that they ascribe to it a modern perspective with regard to the papacy, and then either condemn or approve the "quote Middle Ages" end quote in terms of their attitude towards the claims of the papacy. Their historical perspective is thus conditioned by the reactions to an ecclesiastical dogma rather than by an examination of a culture. Because it was a Christian era, the humanists wrongly ascribed to it a lack of scientific and intellectual vigour. Because it was Catholic, Protestants ascribed to it a lack of biblical zeal and interest. But Thomas Aquinas was more conscientious and faithful in his adherence to Scripture than our most Protestant Arminians and Modernists, whose faith is simply a degraded Thomism, lacking in Aquinas' faith and intelligence. The failure of Aquinas was not in ignorance of the Bible, but in the importation of Aristotelian thought into his apologetics. In 12th century England, in the Diocese of Worcester, a preacher had quoted poetry rather than the Bible in his sermon, and the congregation held an indignation Indignation meeting? Indignant meeting? Hmm. And the congregation held an indignation meeting after the church and and his congregation held an indignation meeting after church and compelled him to recant the following Sunday. Much earlier, before the Norman conquest, one can find in a major document wherein the primacy of the papacy is affirmed, a thoroughly biblical and quote-unquote Protestant doctrine of the nature of the church as stated in Matthew 16, 15-19, wherein Christ defines the rock on which he will build his church, 
It is difficult to find as clear a statement in most Protestant commentaries. Jesus then said, What say ye that I am? Peter answered him, Thou art Christ, the living God's Son. The Lord to him said for answer, Blessed art thou, Simon, dove's child, etc. Bede the Expounder unveils to us the deepness of this lesson. The Lord said to Peter, Thou art rockin', note literally stonin', having the same relation to stone as rockin' to rock, golden to gold, earthen to earth, etc., For the strength of his faith and for the firmness of his confession, he received that name because he joined himself with steadfast mind to Christ, who is called a rock by the Apostle Paul. And I will build my church upon this book. I'm not in pain. Pain is temporary. And I will build my church upon this rock, that is, upon the faith which thou confessest. All God's convocation is built upon the rock, that is, upon Christ, because he is the ground wall of all the structures of his own church. The Roman Catholic approaches the so-called medieval era, believing that it possessed a modern papal unity and authority which did not then exist. It was, indeed, the very struggle for that unity which destroyed the culture and led to the chronic conflicts of succeeding eras. The earlier unity of Christendom had been a religious unity, a Christian unity which was a reality in a decentralised civilization. The basic localism of feudal culture governed both church and state. The struggle of both the papacy and the empire was directed against one another, but it was also directed against feudalism, and both papacy and empire worked to subjugate church and state to their own authority. They used feudalism to destroy feudalism. When the ultimacy of the particulars of the many becomes progressively more and more imminent and less and less transcendent, then unity is denied as both bondage and fiction to the same degree as particularity is affirmed Conversely, when unity moves from a transcendental to an imminent reality, particularity becomes an oppressive violation of true order, and the suppression of particularity becomes a necessity for the realisation of social order. The validity of the imminent one and many, and of the creaturely one and many, is maintained only when the reality, primacy and ultimacy of the transcendental one and many are clearly and sharply maintained, upheld and defined. With Innocent III, 1198-1216, the papacy asserted the supreme authority of one sphere over all other spheres. In his consecration sermon on St. Peter's Sunday, February 22nd, 1198, Pope Innocent spoke in Matthew 24-45, Who thinkest thou is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath appointed over his family, to give them meat in due season? The sermon is the key to his statesmanship in the sixteen years to come, according to Clayton. Pope Innocent declared himself to be under God, yet above man, less than God, but greater than man, appointed to judge all men, but to be judged by none. You see then who is a servant placed by his Lord over his household. He is the vicar of Jesus Christ, the successor of Peter, the anointed of the Lord God of Pharaoh, one set above. Mm. Ouch. One set as an intermediary between God and man, under God, yet above man, less than God, but greater than man. He is Peter in the fullness of his power appointed to judge all men, but to be judged by none, since, as the Apostle has said, He that judgeth me is the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4, 4. I tell you what, I'm going to some lengths here. Oh boy, I tell you what, Ah, things I do. 
things I do. Oh, things I do, I love. But the monarchs and the emperor as well increasingly made similar claims for themselves. Their sacramental consecration made them rex et sacerdos, whereby the ruler not only became the chosen mediator between the clergy and people, but also imposed on him the duty of ruling his church. The king did not need to ally him. The king did not need to ally with a church which was tied to him by proprietary and sacerdotal bonds. It was his church, and he was its divinely appointed ruler. One clergyman ascribed primacy to the king. The Anonymous of York held the bishops of the realm to be subordinate to the king, as it was held that the son is to the father, a definitely subordinationist Christology, according to Tellenbach's summary of this position. For him, the king embodies the divine, the priests, the human nature of Christ. Christ was both king and priest, but the king in him was the higher. The church is the bride, not of Christ as priest, but of Christ as king. And he even dares to point out that the church is called queen, not priestess. According to Williams, the prevailing imagery is royal rather than sacerdotal. Christ as rex et sacerdos. Sacerdocio. Sacerdote. Sacerdos. Christ as rex et sacerdos is divinely king and only humanly a priest. In earlier thinking, the concept of sovereignty was reserved to God alone. It was this absence of sovereignty that was revived in colonial America and in the constitutional settlement to make uh, the United States a Protestant feudal restoration. Christian Europe, after the fall of Rome, developed a social order which reserved sovereignty to God. According to Kern, certainly the monarchical principle, even in this form, precluded any idea of popular sovereignty. The people in the Middle Ages were no more regarded as sovereign than was the monarch. If we wish to use this inappropriate expression at all for the Middle Ages, we may only say, God is sovereign, and the law which binds both the monarch and the community is equally sovereign, so long as it does not run counter to God. The monarch on the one hand, and the community on the other, are joined together in the theocratic order in such a way that both are subordinate to God and to the law. This fundamental conception will be fully discussed later. The point here is that in the Middle Ages, the monarchical principle, or the monarch's divine mandate, had not yet freed the monarch from the dependence upon popular will as the later theory of divine right freed him. The monarchical principle was indeed strong enough to hinder the emergence of a democratic principle at a time when even the head of a local community was conceded some measure of self-sufficiency in the exercise of his functions when he was entrusted with a mandate for which he was responsible only to God, with a guardianship. But the monarchical principle was an ideal con. But the monarchical principle was an ideal concept rather than one of positive law. It did not relieve the individual possessor of power from the particular legal obligations which he assumed towards the community at the time of his admission to office or afterwards. There was a transcendental element in government as such that the individual holder of power, whether in a small community or in the monarchy, could not base his personal and subjective claim to rule upon this entirely general principle. A particular legal title was essential, and such a title could, in the early Middle Ages, be obtained only from the people. 
In addition, it is the individual's task to protect the law against all, even against the state. The concept that all men were subordinated to one infallible, supreme and superhuman justice manifested on earth, whether in church or empire, was alien to Christian Europe. Church, state and empire introduced this concept to the degree that Aristotelian and other pagan thoughts infected their thinking. Some thinkers ascribed a redemptive function to the state. John of Jandam held that the promotion of the good life is the concern of the state. Both churchmen and monarchs began to identify themselves very closely with God and Christ. Not only in their order, but also in their disorder, they believed that they meant they believed that they manifested God of Henry II 1154 to 1189 of England here says Henry II who threw himself to the ground and bit the carpet in his rages said on more than one occasion The displeasure and wrath of Almighty God are also my displeasure and wrath. By nature, I am a son of wrath. Why should I not rage? Why should I not rage? God himself rages when he is wrathful. Ah, well. Free your mind from mental slavery. What a make you not yet? Yeah, that's a book. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to leave it there. Um, thanks very much for tuning in to the Booth of Truth. Always a pleasure, never a chore. I'm sorry if I make it excruciatingly, excruciatingly painful for you to listen to all this, but it's messy but it's happening bit by bit if you want to support this work of getting all of rush Dooney's work or a couple of books into audible format for the audiobook lovers to reach hundreds nay thousands nay tens of thousands nay hundreds of thousands of folks with good solid christian teaching then boom hit me up boom boom come on people um Give me some likes, give me some shares, and you can make a one-off or ongoing financial donation at nathanteacher.com forward slash donations. Thank you very much and hope to see you soon.